So um, I will uh, talk to you about the RNA binding proteins uh, that are involved in uh, ALS and uh, FTD, so amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and frontotemporal dementia. Um, and I will also talk about protein binding RNA. So we'll talk about proteins that bind the RNA and RNAs, specific RNAs that bind uh, proteins. Um, <clears throat> so first, because uh, uh, I understood this is a student lecture, so there's some background uh, here where um, I will tell you a bit about uh, ALS and FTD, although I'm sure you also heard uh, uh, some uh, some uh, some information about this because uh, a big group is uh, uh, a couple of groups are working on um, proteins involved in ALS and FTD also here. Um, then uh, pathology, um, how how in ALS we have a loss of neurons, and uh, like all the neurodegenerative diseases or majority of neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, these two also have involves accumulation of uh, uh, and aggregation of uh, certain proteins. And these are the uh, three proteins that we're working on. So uh, TDP43, uh, FAS, and uh, c 9 orf 72 So what is uh, ALS? It's a terrible disease. It's a, um, it's a muscle-wasting disease, and it happens because... Uh, motor neurons uh, degenerate, therefore the innervation of the uh, muscles is uh, lower, and uh, it's a progressive disease, so it becomes progressively worse. Uh, so uh, from uh, people become progressively paralyzed, they're unable to walk, uh, talk, uh, feed, and so on. Uh, uh, also diaphragm stop, stops functioning, so they need uh, assisted uh, breathing towards uh, the end. Uh, some some uh, sensations are spared, eye movement is spared, um, and people uh, die usually from, diagnos uh, from diagnosis to death is about uh, two to three years. So it's a relatively uh, a quick uh, uh, disease and uh, there is no treatment. Um, it's uh, um, in, in 50s, uh, is usually mid 50s is uh, the onset. It's mainly a sporadic disease, so 90 to 95 percent of the patients uh, are sporadic. They have no family history. Um, there's slightly more males uh, that get it, and it is, belongs to relatively rare diseases. So uh, there's an incidence of two, two and two, about two uh, per 100,000 population pretty much everywhere in the world uh, get uh, the disease. Uh, with a turnover, or I mean, with uh, so that's uh, three year um, from diagnosis to death. It means that there's like about six to eight uh, uh, per hundred thousand um, having the disease. Um, prognosis: so once it's diagnosed, it's really difficult to uh, predict. Uh, Fifty percent of people have this. Uh, uh, relatively uh, short duration. Uh, there is, uh, there's, uh, there's patients that uh, live uh, uh, a lot longer. Some patients can live uh, a really, really long time with a disease like Stephen Hawking, who's been living with it for um, 50 years. He's very, very unusual in that sense uh, as well. Um, so uh, the other disease, frontotemporal dementia, um, frontal and uh, uh, temporal lobes are atrophied. Um, it is uh, slightly different than Alzheimer's, so different regions are affected. So in Alzheimer's, we have this uh, loss of memory as first, uh, first uh, one of the first symptoms here. It's more uh, personality changes uh, and some cognition changes. And the uh, um, age of onset is similar. Um, it is uh, rarer than Alzheimer's, so about 3 to 20 percent of dementias are frontotemporal dementia, uh, but it is a uh, very common dementia in uh, earlier uh, aged, uh, uh, in younger populations, so 45, 45 to uh, 64 um, is the same as with Alzheimer's, so there's quite a lot of uh, early frontotemporal dementia. Uh, <coughs> so in terms of uh, Genetics. Uh, this is the um, this is a, a 
relatively recent view of uh, discovery of genes uh, in, uh, whose mutations are involved in ALS. The size of the circle kind of represents the um, abundance of this mutation in, um, in uh, ALS. And uh, uh, you can see here, this is uh, the big effect of this, uh, of new next generation sequencing. So there's uh, uh, a, uh, a lot of new genes discovered. And these are the three genes that uh, we will be uh, uh, talking about uh, today. Um, just, yeah, um, we've done a bit of genetics in Slovenia as well, which we're quite proud of. <laughs> so uh, we collected about uh, 100 patients, and uh, uh, we saw a few, I mean, uh, one TDP, one first mutation, uh, about 5.9%, uh, uh, so I think five uh, C9 or 72 mutations. So it kind of is representative for what is expected um, in terms of uh, the abundance of these mutations in, um, in ALS. Um, <coughs> so why do uh, neurons uh, degenerate? Uh, in 95% of uh, ALS cases, uh, we have uh, cytoplasmic accumulation of protein uh, TDP43, which you all should know quite well. Um, so TDP43 is a nuclear protein, and it aggregates in the cytoplasm. This is a motor neuron, so none, none in the, uh, very little in the nucleus, and these aggregates in the cytoplasm. Uh, <coughs> and uh, in frontotemporal dementia, we have a similar case where we have these aggregates forming in the cytoplasm and loss of uh, TDP in the uh, uh, nucleus. And uh, these uh, uh, diseases now, uh, like, uh, I mean, other neurodegenerative diseases where they're like uh, tau involved their tauopathies and so on, so uh, uh, sinochloronopathies in, uh, in Parkinson's, so TDP43 proteinopathies is now the kind of umbrella term for diseases which have TDP43 aggregation. Also, uh, recent studies show that up to 60% of Alzheimer's um, shows uh, some degree of uh, TDP43 uh, pathology. So what could be the cause of this disease? One is obvious, so these uh, cytoplasmic aggregates are toxic, they kill the neuron, therefore you get the disease. The other one is possibly because uh, we see the accumulation in the cytoplasm, but we also see loss of uh, uh, protein in the nucleus, uh, could be loss of um, nuclear function. Uh, <coughs> so uh, we, I mean, I forgot to mention this uh, slide. Uh, this, is, uh, this is actually quite, uh, was quite a revolutionary finding, quite a shift in our field. So this is 10 years ago. So uh, Neumann, 2006 where they actually show that these aggregates are TDP43, and the whole, and especially with 95% of the cases showing these aggregates, the whole ALS and FTD field made a big shift towards trying to understand what these RNA binding proteins are uh, doing in the disease. So um, uh, at that time, I was working in the genetics of ILS uh, group in King's College, uh, um, London, and we uh, started looking for um, mutations in TDP43, and uh, very soon uh, we discovered them, uh, and uh, uh, this TDP43, and uh, late our group and other groups that show, looked at the mutations showed that TDP43 mutations, almost all of them accumulate in this uh, glycine-rich uh, C-terminal region, uh, with the hint that uh, RNA binding proteins may be important. We went to look at another interesting region uh, that is associated with the ALS, and we found that in that region, uh, FUS mutations occurred. So when it's not TDP43 uh, that is accumulating in ALS, those 5% that are remaining, 1% of that is FUS. Then there's a SOD1 and a couple of other genes which I will not uh, a SOD1 and some other genes which were not mentioned or, or it's not known yet. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, yeah, so both genes 
Uh, there's about more than 40 mutations known uh, for each gene uh, to date. Uh, there's almost no mutation associated with frontotemporal dementia. So all the mutations for, for, um, from FUS and TDP43 are associated with ALS. Uh, <coughs> because they are RNA binding proteins, uh, we, uh, we got together with uh, Yerne Ule, who was then in, uh, in Cambridge, uh, in, um, uh, and he just started the lab there, and um, he was an expert. He uh, just developed this uh, CLIP methodology, cross-linking immunoprecipitation, which is used to uh, discover the RNA binding targets of, uh, of, um, of RNA binding proteins. So uh, we, we've done CLIP on TDP43 and FUS, and TDP43 was, was shown on the, on the genome-wide uh, scale to uh, bind to, or transcriptome-wide scale to bind to a UG-rich uh, uh, stretches. So these, uh, the height of these peaks is also associated with the amount of uh, UGs in this, uh, in this sequence. Uh, FUS, on the other hand, um, didn't have any uh, specific uh, uh, sequence uh, uh, motifs. We saw maybe slight uh, um, kind of indication that there's some uh, co-transcriptional uh, binding. So at the beginning of introns, there was a, a stronger binding or more fast than towards the end of uh, uh, introns. Uh, and um, what, um <coughs> what I uh, focused on uh, at that uh, uh, time was as, uh, as well was uh, uh, because of this uh, change in the localization uh, between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. One possibility was that the nuclear transport was uh, somehow uh, damaged, and uh, so we had to look at uh, <coughs> ways or, or try to describe ways how TDP uh, goes into the nucleus, and. Uh, <clears throat> what we did is we had uh, an RNAi library where we uh, looked at uh, we, uh, there was RNAis uh, uh, against uh, uh, siRNAs against uh, uh, nuclear transport factors. There was about a hundred of them, and we screened and we looked uh, for uh, cells where uh, TDP43 uh, was. So this is pre predominantly nuclear TDP43. We looked for cells where we had an increase in the cytoplasmic uh, TDP43, and we found five of those which were uh, which uh, had an effect. Um, NUP6254 and L1 are part of this uh, subcomplex in the nuclear pore. They're really important for the transport of all the proteins through the nuclear pore. So obviously, if they are damaged, there will be some effect on the uh, import. And KPNB1 and CAS are involved in the classical um, nuclear import. So, um, how does this work? Um, so, we have cargo, uh, we have a trailer, and we have a truck. So, if we have, if we think of TDP43 as a cargo, carefarin alphas, so this is class, classical import, we have uh, as a trailer. And then we have a caraferin betas, which is a truck. So you need a trailer to, car to, to ha carry the cargo and a truck to transport everything across the nuclear pore. So we have TDP43 binding to caraferin alphas. That binds together with caraferin beta in the cytoplasm. Caraferin beta transfers, transfers everything into the nucleus where the complex falls apart. Beta can go back to do its thing. TDP stays in the nucleus. Alpha, so the trailer needs another type of truck to take it out, and that's CAS. So, uh, and then alpha is outside in the, in the cytoplasm. So we have, I didn't uh, show any of the Western blots or the cell experiments here uh, showing how we, uh, we came to this. But basically, if you have, if you have loss of uh, Beta, TDP, and caraferin alpha are accumulating in the cytoplasm. If you have loss of CAS, uh, what will happen is that uh, alpha will accumulate in the nucleus, and 
therefore will not be available in the cytoplasm to carry TDP into the nucleus. So in some way, uh, changes in the amount or location of nuclear transport factors uh, may cause this uh, cytoplasmic accumulation of TDP-43. So this is quite uh, a few years back uh, that we've done this study, uh, but now recent studies from last year where they were looking at uh, c 9 orf 72 the gene that we're going to talk towards the end. Um, they've shown that c 9 orf 72 through various ways, actually affects uh, one, of their, one of its main targets is transport factors. So actually, there is a disturbance in transport factors, uh, apparently, in, in ALS and frontotemporal dementia. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing that we looked at, I mean, everything is connected. So in a way, we're showing transport factors affecting uh, TDP43 um, localization. Um, uh, here, there was big a lot of work, a big work done on autoregulation. So TDP43 regulates its own transcription. Uh, you must have heard now uh, also TDP43 seems to regulate, the, uh, uh, from what we've seen, also the nuclear transport factors. So by working on, uh, by regulating their uh, messenger RNAs, uh, it can regulate uh, transport factors. Uh, so we've uh, done a proteomic study where we looked at um, where we looked uh, at uh, what's happening in the in the cells following knockdown of TDP43, and uh, as you can see, this uh, intracellular transport is one of the uh, main functions uh, that was uh, shown in gene ontology and uh, also RNA processing. So beside this uh, autoregulation, there's probably there's also a lot of regulation of other um, RNA binding proteins. Uh, this has uh, been uh, uh, validated, so this is for uh, Marco, just uh, to see a little bit about this, uh, so how much loss we have uh, with the TDP uh, knockdown. This is RAN BP1, where you can see uh, uh, where there's four s three cells here which almost have no RAN BP1 following knockdown of uh, uh, TDP43, also for uh, DNA methyl transferase 3A, we have uh, slightly less of an effect, uh, but uh, still um, uh, some effect. Uh, <clears throat> now, um, an interesting thing that happened to us in, in uh, this study, uh, we said, okay, so this uh, so ran BP1 uh, DNA methyl transferase, let's see what's happening in, in mice. Uh, we got some uh, knockout mice uh, from uh, Jean uh, Sobwe, who's, um, who has actually uh, tissue-specific or motor neuron-specific knockout. So we had like that, that has about 50% of motor neurons will have a knockout of uh, TDP43. Uh, and uh, we thought that would be a fantastic place to validate this, and we saw nothing. So then uh, it was quite, quite a disappointment. Um, until we had a look at uh, the introns of uh, these, uh, our genes of interest. And it seems that the genes were picked to validate uh, the introns in mice are completely different. And uh, so RAMBP1, this is binding in the intron um, in the sushis in uh, human ES cells. I see very strong binding in this intron in RAMBP1. But then when you look at the mouse, the intron is uh, different. There's no UG repeats there. So that's quite possibly the reason why, um, why we didn't have uh, a validation and also kind of gave me uh, some more doubt in mouse models for some of the splicing work uh, studies that, uh, um, that we used for validation. Uh, <coughs> then uh, as a follow-up of... Uh, of this uh, study, we uh, used the model that was developed here. So we showed that the loss of TDP influences all these genes. We wanted to see whether a loss of TDP through aggregation also uh, can have a similar effect. And uh, so we used these uh, uh, TDP 4312QN. Uh, uh, I'm sure you all know of this construct, so uh, I, I don't know whether to go into it uh, that much, but. Basically, there's this uh, uh, region 
of uh, 30 uh, amino acids uh, here in the in the TDP, which uh, shows uh, which confirms some aggregation proneness to uh, TDP43, and the constructs that have been made uh, amplify this region, and so this TDP43 is very um, aggregation prone, uh, especially also when uh, this um, RM uh, domains are uh, inactivated. So actually, uh, TDP43 here shown this flag construct is uh, starts aggregating in the nucleus, and it also sequesters the endogenous TDP43. Um, <clears throat> these are just uh, validation of the construct. So uh, in our sushi cells, we have the splicing changes for RAMBP1 and the one that uh, Paul Dip3, which you've developed here. Uh, uh, we, so uh, when we transferred the cell system to our lab, uh, that uh, everything uh, worked as it should. Um, and a list of proteins, so the proteins that were uh, shown to be uh, strongest changers in our proteomic study, and that we had antibo available antibodies that worked well. Um, uh, so that's the list of proteins that we have uh, uh, checked the the the, the analysis was um, done through Western blotting and uh, and uh, uh, immunocytochemistry and pretty much uh, 53 percent of the proteins that we saw uh, changing in the knockdown and when I say knockdown this was a very it was like a 90 more than 90 percent 95 percent knockdown that we used for the proteomic study so and uh, one would expect that in this study we have slightly less reduction of TDP43. So 53% of the proteins uh, were um, validated. Um, and then also looking at uh, the, the <coughs> immunocytochemistry, I mean, this is a, a really busy slide. I mean, we looked at uh, cytoplasmic nuclear uh, um, staining, but uh, what we saw was... Um, it's very hard to see, but basically, I mean, this is the quantification of it. About 77 percent, when we looked at the immunocytochemistry, were validated in ICC in this aggregation model compared to uh, <coughs> compared to knockdown model. So um, that's uh, our uh, recent work on TDP43. Uh, <coughs> now uh, to FAS. Um, <coughs> following the uh, discovery of um, the mutation in FAS and uh, modeling uh, in cells, what we observed was that uh, the mutations uh, lead to uh, loss of FAS in the nucleus, loss of signal in the nucleus, and these formation of these uh, uh, aggregates in the, in the cytoplasm and, and many cell lines that... Uh, um, we tested. Uh, so there was actual indication that uh, this uh, uh, mutation uh, might be having an effect on the nuclear import of uh, FUS. Um, so we devised uh, an experiment where we have uh, um, removed this uh, last uh, 16 amino acids um, that had the mutations in them. Um, then also, we've done a rescue experiment where on top of the mutation, we added a non-mutated 16 amino acids. And uh, <coughs> looking at cells, so wild type normally goes into nucleus, GFP. Um, when we uh, remove the whole of NLS, we have a very extreme lack of nuclear import. And when we go uh, into, um, these are some of the, uh, so this is the weakest mutation of the three. Um, no, actually, this is the weakest. This is the strongest. So uh, um, even here, there's an aggregation in the cytoplasm and slightly less in the nucleus. And we add the NLS back to the uh, construct. Uh, even with the mutation, it goes into the nucleus. Um, <coughs> we were quite intrigued what these uh, granules were, uh, as was uh, many groups uh, following the discovery of the mutation and... Uh, uh, along with other groups, we've shown that uh, these, um, these granules, fuzz granules in the cytoplasm are actually um, 
are actually uh, stress granules. So these are regions where uh, there's um, following uh, stress, uh, there's an accumulation of uh, uh, proteins involved in translation. So there's uh, RNA and uh, the beginning initiation of translation uh, proteins. So in translation with stress is arrested and these proteins and RNAs aggregate in, this, in, this, in these uh, stress granules. So, um, <clears throat> and when the stress is removed, the, the proteins can, uh, the RNAs can start translating again. Uh, so, one of the things also that we noticed uh, was uh, obviously when we looked at uh, tissues, uh, well, in patient tissues, uh, we saw that uh, the mutants um, have uh, almost all of the fuss is in the cytoplasm. So, one allele is mutated, the other one is not. So, why don't we have 50% in the nucleus still? And um, <clears throat> following a set of experiments on, uh, on cells and also on uh, patient fibroblasts, uh, we saw that actually uh, mutation that actually increases the um, mutant fuss in the, in the cytoplasm also sequesters wild type fuss. And there's, uh, so these aggregates, these stress granules actually um, sequester uh, wild type. Now, <clears throat> One of the things um, <coughs> I showed all those mutations uh, in the beginning uh, of the of the talk and uh, for TDP and for FAS, but what I have to say is that they are very rare when we look at all of uh, ALS and uh, and I said in front of temporal dementia there are no mutations. So with uh, in ALS maybe one percent of ALS is, uh, comes from uh, uh, mutations. The rest the ninety five. 94% is actually wild type TDP43 that's aggregating, and in front of temporal dementia, it's mainly um, wild type. Uh, so, <coughs> what other method could reduce this uh, um, nuclear import? And uh, some groups have um, focused on uh, uh, arginines here in these RGG rich regions, and shown that methylation of arginines can have an effect on uh, FUS binding to uh, the nuclear transport factor, uh, its own, it has a different nuclear transport machinery uh, <coughs> to, to TDP43. Uh, and we decided to look at this uh, last, uh, last uh, tyrosine, uh, so uh, in, the, uh, in the NLS. Um, we've done a series, a series of uh, mutations, uh, inclusion, including deletion of the tyrosine, and when tyrosine is deleted, uh, you can see that uh, in primary HELAs and primary neurons, uh, FUS almost doesn't go into the nucleus. Um, <coughs> when, uh, we have, when we have phenylalanine, um, it goes uh, slightly in, and phenylalanine is kind of like a non-phosphorylated tyrosine uh, model. Uh, now, <coughs> are we, uh, this is not the only tyrosine on FUS. So FUS has uh, quite a lot of uh, tyrosines, I think about 36. Uh, so we, decide, we didn't know how to actually check which, which tyrosines are phosphorylated or not. So we devised some, um, uh, some models where we actually added this last part of FUS that didn't have any tyrosines except the last tyrosine uh, to GFP and HIS, and then we did some uh, studies where we showed that actually this, uh, this uh, tyrosine here can be uh, phosphorylated by using this uh, phosphotyrosine um, antibody. Uh, FUS, or this NLS, binds to uh, another uh, transport uh, uh, factor, which is called transportin. Uh, Um, and um, <coughs> so in order to see whether uh, this uh, phosphorylation influences the binding to transport, in, transport in we, uh, we got some biotinylated peptides with phosphotyrosine in the end or normal tyrosine and did this interaction studies where we pulled down, uh, where we showed uh, TMPO binding to uh, non-phosphorylated uh, tyrosine and uh, not binding to phosphotyrosine. We did some modeling as well, and we showed that uh, 
uh, when it's uh, phosphorylated here, there's a steric and charge hindrance. So actually, so this is uh, the purple or, uh, or blue here is, uh, is uh, FUS, the NLS of FUS, and the gold is uh, transporting one. And um, we show that the mutation um, gives steric and, uh, not mutation, but phosphorylation gives uh, steric and charge uh, hindrance and uh, explains the <coughs> loss of uh, interaction. Uh, <coughs> we then did a quick uh, study of uh, what uh, uh, what could be affecting the, or what could be leading to this uh, uh, phosphorylation. Um, we showed that uh, SARC uh, family kinases uh, are involved in this uh, phosphorylation. Um, and uh, we're still kind of trying to figure out uh, um, <coughs> the extent of this and the importance of this for uh, the disease itself. Now the last, uh, last gene <coughs> is C9R72. Uh, <coughs> there's a lot of uh, question marks. It's a new gene. It was uh, uh, discovered uh, uh, or associated with ALS uh, uh, and FTD five years ago uh, without much of its function known. Uh, <coughs> what happens uh, with, uh, uh, with in ALS and frontotemporal dementia in, in carriers of this uh, mutation is that in this region here, which is part of an intron of uh, uh, some of the transcripts, there is an expansion of uh, pure GC, so four Gs and two Cs. Uh, usually, we have about two, maybe up to 19, 20 repeats uh, in a healthy population. But with patients, what happens is that uh, there's an increase, and the, you can go up to 500, even to 5,000 of uh, pure GC, so pure hexanucleotide um, repeat. Uh, it turned out to be the most common uh, mutation in familial ALS, also in front of temporal dementia. So was, in terms of genetic characterization of diseases, it was a huge, huge uh, uh, move forward. Uh, and uh, this intronic localization means it's transcribed, means that uh, there is possibly some uh, mechanism involving RNA in the, uh, this disease. Uh, <coughs> and it's uh, TDP43 pro proteinopathy. So somehow this leads to aggregation of TDP43, this mutation. So um, pure GC, that is very, very unusual. Uh, that, that was almost unheard of, I think, until uh, here, um, such a long stretch. So one of the things that can happen when you have a G-rich <coughs> uh, region is that uh, this region can form a non-B structure, so non-normal double-stranded DNA structure. So uh, pure G or uh, uh, G-rich regions can form these uh, so-called G uh, quadruplexes, which are four-strand um, structures. Um, and uh, uh, we also show that uh, in the DNA can form these, uh, uh, G4C2 DNA can form these uh, G quadruplexes. Uh, there's the uh, reverse strand as well, and reverse strand is uh, C-rich. And there's been indications that Cs can also form uh, kind of a pseudo four-strand structures where actually the strands that do interact interact through the other pair of strands. I don't know whether you can see that quite uh, uh, here. So there's like this interaction in between uh, the other strand pairing. Uh, <clears throat> and these are called I-motifs. I-motifs are known uh, mainly through artificial kind of uh, situations where because you need uh, a low pH, so you need high amount of protonation to, to for I motifs to form. Um, but we managed to uh, push this a bit uh, towards uh, the uh, <coughs> uh, towards the uh, neutral uh, pH, uh, as I will show you uh, later. Uh, <coughs> now, as I said, this is uh, transcribed. Uh, to make uh, things even more complex, transcription goes in both directions. So we have RNA that is uh, G4C2. We have RNA that is C4G2. This RNA 
can form G quadruplexes and uh, people, there's publications showing these uh, G quadruplexes forming from RNA the, uh, uh, and uh, can also go back on the DNA and form these uh, uh, heteroduplexes, um, so called uh, R loops. And uh, this, we're still waiting to see whether the RNA, uh, the C4G2 RNA can form I motifs. Uh, just to show um, <coughs> another, well, when, we were, when we were studying the I motif uh, structure of the C4G2, one of the experiments that we decided to do is let's mix the two together. So G4C2 and C4G2 DNA together. And uh, what we saw was instead of forming a duplex, uh, it actually preferred forming, uh, remaining in the quadruplex structure and I motif structure. And uh, so this, is, this can be seen in NMR spectra. And um, <coughs> this is the, uh, wh what we needed to do to, to have this form uh, was uh, to actually add the molecular crowding agent. So kind of we were trying to simulate what's happening in the, in the cell. We were adding, we were using potassium. We were going to the neutral pH. We had to add a molecular crowding ag agent, which is polyethylene glycol. And in that case, we had this uh, nice, uh, very strong signal for uh, G quadruplexes. And this uh, green is the signal where we have I motifs. And also there's some I motif uh, signal. Uh, <coughs> yeah, and also everything was done at 37 degrees, so like I say, going to as physiological as possible. Uh, <coughs> so this is the, uh, the picture that uh, we had a few slides back. Now the picture gets even more complex. So this RNA actually gets translated, and it's uh, an, a, a no, an unusual uh, form of translation. So it's, it's called RAN translation. It's uh, non-ATG associated, a repeat associated uh, translation. So when there's repeats, somehow um, the trans, uh, translational machinery finds some secondary structure, can bind to that RNA, and starts translating. So there's no ATG, there's no start codon. Uh, <coughs> the thing is, uh, also, that uh, this uh, translation doesn't have, like I said, doesn't have a specific start. So all tr all three frames are translated. So what we end up having is these. Uh, so we have a hexanucleotide, which means uh, two amino acids, two codons, two amino acids. So we have three frames of uh, from two amino acids. So dipeptide repeats, and because we have antisense transcript as well. We have a situation where we actually have six species of um, dipeptide repeats. So what the heck is the disease mechanism here is a big question now. And um, <clears throat> it could be haploinsufficiency. So this uh, or RNA structures kind of slow down the trans translation of the C9 or 72 protein. There is evidence that C9 or 72 protein is reduced in, uh, in patients. Uh, Repeatedly associated RNA toxicity. So these RNAs can bind. So because they accumulate, they can bind to, uh, uh, they, can, they can form aggregates, and they can bind RNA binding proteins. So what we have shown, and uh, other groups have shown as well, is that these RNAs form uh, RNA foci. So these are like little RNA aggregates in the nucleus. And then these RNA aggregates can um, sequester RNA binding proteins, which means that these RNA binding proteins can't do their uh, normal work. And there's uh, DPR toxicity. So these dipeptides could be toxic. And um, many papers, and this is one of the first ones, show that uh, these uh, peptides are actually expressed in uh, patient cells. Um, we, we decided to look at the, uh, the, the RNA toxicity hypothesis in, uh, in, uh, um, uh, and uh, <coughs> so the idea, like I said, was these, uh, these RNAs would bind different and sequester different RNA binding proteins. 
uh, <coughs> we uh, uh, in 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 my uh, in my lab what we've done is we've done an RNA pull down uh, with a construct that has uh, 48 uh, repeats of uh, uh, G4C2. Um, and uh, we showed that compared to controls, uh, so control was uh, 300 nucleotide long, uh, half of uh, red fluorescent protein, so just something uh, random, just the uh, S1, and uh, uh, S1 is an aptomer, so that enabled us to do the pull-downs. Uh, and we saw these uh, differences, these accumulation, or, or the pull-down of specific uh, uh, proteins in the nuclear and cytoplasmic extracts and repeated that in cortex and uh, cerebellum and these are then the uh, the western blots confirming uh, the six proteins that we saw as uh, strongly changing on our um, on our gels uh, with uh, <coughs> with HNRMPH uh, we uh, went uh, further because uh, uh, Chris Shaw's group at that time also discovered HNRMPH through a different method as a possible binder of uh, these uh, uh, these repeats. Uh, so, uh, and here we sh we see that uh, so even in uh, patient uh, brains we have uh, these foci. I don't know whether you see it. Uh, otherwise, they make a a lot stronger red dot here. Uh, the, my laser. Uh, but anyway, so green uh, HNRMPH foci, perfect colocalization, about 70% of uh, brain tissues. Um, if I go back, um, two of these, uh, first two of these proteins, SFPQ and NONO, uh, were quite uh, intriguing for us uh, uh, because uh, we know that uh, they are um, paraspecal um, uh, proteins. So paraspecals are these uh, granules inside the inside the nuclear uh, nucleus which uh, without really much known function what is known is that they are um, they are it's, they are uh, held together by a non-coding rna called neat1 it's a really long non-coding rna and <coughs> and that's about it actually i mean there's uh, uh, there is some indications that they may be involved in uh, binding other RNAs, maybe ALU element containing RNAs, but this is kind of still some indications. <coughs> anyway, uh, what we, like I said, what we saw was that SFPQ and uh, NONO uh, really bind well with uh, G4C2 uh, foci. Um, and <coughs> then we did the double fish, so we stained for uh, NEAT1. And for foci, uh, we did for sense foci. We also have anti-sense foci, uh, so C4G2 forming foci. Um, and uh, actually, um, in a way, it was quite uh, um, interesting. Um, the localization with uh, NEAT1 was very low. Um, and uh, some of those, some of these localizations, actually, if you if you look, I mean, it's really hard to see in these pictures. Are really kind of just because the dots are very close to each other, there's not really uh, like a normal overlay that you would say is like what you would expect with colocalization. Uh, <coughs> so uh, then uh, the next <coughs> the next experiment, actually the last one here that, that I will show, is uh, as we are still working on this, is that uh, when you remove neat one, so this was a knockdown of t neat one. Um, we still have a foci forming. So actually, um, SFPQ a foci forming. So actually, these granules are forming, but they're not paraspecals, although they have all the characteristic paraspecal proteins. So beside SFPQ and NONO that I showed here uh, that we got with the pull down, we went with some of the other known uh, paraspecal proteins, and they also co localize with uh, G4C2. Uh, granules. Um, so last picture, uh, the lab. Uh, I screamed the most here. Uh, and uh, I think it was also because the colleague actually took my collar and, and uh, pulled it back when he pulled the, uh, poured the ice down. 
uh, my Mac, but anyway, so this is my uh, this is the group um, that uh, my lab and uh, the collaborators involved in this work, uh, the funding, and uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>